Hi everyone, my name is Mohammed Bank and I'm a businessman. And my idea of a real man is somebody who is actually a gentleman. Somebody who can go out as a warrior during the daytime. And when he gets home, take off that armor and be a gentle, beautiful soul, not only for his wife, but also for his children, and impact society and friends and neighbors in a really positive manner. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I don't know where you're watching us from. This is the O Men Show. I am your friend and your coach, Robert Brawley. A show for men, by men. Well, we're not looking for perfect men. We're looking for men who want to be better tomorrow than they are today. Men who have a story. Men who are willing to show their scars. Not out of arrogance or pride, but show their scars to help other people. If there's a young man, and even a young woman for that matter, watching, something that you will pick up by the time you're done with the show. Like, wow, I enjoyed the show, but I picked some nuggets that will help me get better and in upward mobility. Well, today is no different. I have a very personal friend of mine, my good friend, and a great, great man. Well, I know you will all love him. Mr. Bank is his name. How are you doing, sir? Very good, Robert. It's great to be on the show. No, thank you for coming. Thank you for honoring our invite. No, it's such a pleasure to be here. And honestly. you're such a timekeeper. Uh, thank you. You know, thank I drove you. in and I'm seeing you come like, okay, so yeah. the guest got here before me today. It's my past. It's just the way I've been trained. So right. uh, I'm, I'm usually on time wherever I go. Okay. Yeah, at least two or three minutes before at least. For the viewers who don't know you, mm -hmm. I mean, who are you? Growing up. Just a family man. Grew up in Kenya. Uh, third generation Asian now. Fourth generation Asian now. Uh, grown up in a very, very poor neighborhood. Um, living the Kenyan dream. Basically worked hard. Got a beautiful wife. Lovely son. And uh, have just uh, worked really hard. Average to just make a good life for myself and my family. Right. Yeah. Siblings? Brothers? Sisters? Yes. I've got two sisters. A nephew. Two nephews. Uh, one lives in uh, Congo now and the other one is here, runs a restaurant in uh, Westlands, okay. uh, which is fantastic. Both of my sisters are hairdressers. So, um, yeah, it's a nice, neat little family. And of course, we lost our parents a couple of years back. Oh. So, uh, here in Kenya? Yeah, here in Kenya. Okay. So, you know, uh, just uh, it's, it's this generation now that's uh, the example to the next, really. All right. Yeah. So you grew up in Nairobi, went to school in Nairobi? Went to school in Nairobi, Aga Khan Academy, and then USIU eventually. Okay. Uh, and then started my working life here and uh, had the opportunity to work abroad for about 15 to 20 years, mainly in the Middle East and uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so came back with a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts a lot of feelings and decided to go into business for myself. So have dabbled in various businesses. So I'm a freelance businessman who uh, who just does a lot of work. What was your first job? Here My first job here was a very interesting one with Doshi Ceramics. Okay. Yeah. My salary was, I think, 7,000 shillings and I was a sanitary salesman. So I used to sell toilets and tiles. And um, when I did that, it was the biggest shock of my life because I did not know there was such a big market for it until I made one of my biggest sales and um, had a chance to speak to my boss at that time mm -hmm. and turned around to him and said, listen, won't I make more on commission? He said, yeah, but nobody wants to go on commission. So I said, I want to go on commission. So we forsook my salary and we started a job on commission. And uh, two months later, I was making more money than practically everybody else in the company. Right. So that was nice fantastic. Position. Yeah, it was. Then you say you went to the Middle East for a while. Yes. Why did you come back? I mean, many people uh, leave and they come back just on holiday and they go back. Everybody's in the US, some in the UK, mm. different countries. What made you come back? Beautiful question, Robert. Uh, my, my father passed away. Okay. So when my dad passed away, in our culture, we don't leave our elders just like that. So it was a decision because I was working for Marriott's at that time. Hotel, and uh, my, my, my career projector, pro projectory was really, really good. Um, come to think of it, about 10 years ago, I would have probably made vice president for the Middle East at some point. Okay. Uh, that's, that's how high I was climbing. Mm -hmm. However, there was a very, very big decision to make whether to come back here and look after my mother or continue with my career over there. So for two years, I was in limbo. And um, the limbo was that uh, I wanted my mother to come there. But because she was so used to the mosque, her friends, her rituals, how everything worked, I saw that if I brought her to the Middle East, she'd be a duck out of water and it wouldn't work for her. And I realized that my parents had sacrificed so much for me that this was now a juncture that God had put me on and he knew better. So 
either I take her out and follow my career or I leave my career and come back home and make sure she is comfortable. But the only quagmire I had with that was that if I come back home, what am I going to do? Right. So I didn't know what to do. So for two years while I was debating that, uh, one day I just got inspired when I was in the Middle East and I said to myself, you know something, uh, my daily calls to my mom and um, realized that she was going into depression after missing my dad because they were happily married for over 40 years and she was really missing him. And you know, a son's love is a son's love. So I said, you know what, let me just sacrifice this and maybe God has a better plan. So with a stone on my heart, I, I resigned and I came back to Kenya. And uh, after that, God has opened one door after the next door, after the next door. And um, unfortunately, she passed on about, uh, about five years ago. But at least my wife and I had the opportunity to look after her and uh, see her through her toughest years, right. um, which are with her health. So it's not a regret at all. Now, when you came back, left a, a well-paying job, very good job. Yeah. You said in your culture, you don't leave the elderly like that. So no. you've come back. Mm -hmm. You're the only son? I'm the only son. Yes. Yeah. So you're taking the position of your father, for he, lack of a better word. Yes. Now, you've come back. The man of the house, yes. so to say. Yes. No job. Yes. How was that then? That was tough. Because uh, I made a lot of mistakes in business. And sorry, I'm asking that because I know the pressure that men go through sometimes, mm -hmm. that you have to step up when mm -hmm. the patriarch mm -hmm. has exited the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the pressure of, you know, you have to take care of things the way dad used to do it. Mm -hmm. So tell, tell me some of the pressures you went through before you get deeper into your story. So beautiful dynamic over here because what happened is my elder sister, who's elder to me by 10 years, she's one of the most beautiful souls, Neelam. What she wanted to do was she has sacrificed her life for our family. And it's something I really, really thank her for wow. till today. I remember in my prayers till today. And what she decided was, you know what, because I'm older, I'll step up. Now, I was 10 years younger thinking I'm the man, so I'll step up, you know. And there was my mother who was in depression thinking, hang on a second, we've just lost our dad and I'm the eldest in the family, so I'll give the family direction. And to be very honest with you, Everybody came from such a clean place in their heart, but we weren't organized in our energy. So there were a lot of clashes, unfortunately, uh, in that dynamic because my mother wanted to lead. You know, she's a strong woman, mm -hmm. worked for the British government for 45 years. Uh, my sister wanted to lead because by, by virtue, she felt, hang on, mom needs to relax, so I'll take over the baton. And I thought, hang on a second, I'm the man of the house and I'll take over the baton. So. Uh, you know, th there was a lot of uh, overlap over there when it came to energies and everything else, which um, when you look at it in hindsight, had we organized ourselves a little better and just had a few clearer conversations, I think life would have been a lot more peaceful. But everyone came from a very pure hearted place. But the family was very, very confused after my father passed away okay. So on who would lead and who would not. Um, add to the fact that I was a little inexperienced at that time. Um, so the little savings that I had from the Middle East, well, they were decent savings at that time. But you learn a lot about yourself and you learn a lot about business at that time. Mm -hmm. And if you're green, people take advantage of you. So right. I lost a lot of money in the beginning when I came back to Kenya. It was always my dream to be a businessman. Um, so I started on that path. And uh, before you know it, within two years, life, uh, you know, they say in Kiswahili, usi fundishwa na mamake, fundishwa na dunia. So the world taught me a couple of good lessons. Tough ones. <laughs> <laughs> lessons that I take with me till today. So right. they, they really rounded me up. Yeah. Okay. They made me a better person. You've for talked sure. about married to a beautiful lady. You have a lovely son. Yes. It wasn't always that way. No, it wasn't. Right. It wasn't always that way. So it was a fairy tale beginning. Uh, I'd always told my parents that, look, you know, with the Indian culture, there is always this pressure that your parents will be involved with choosing your wife. Right. But my parents were open minded enough to let me know that, listen, if you want to choose your wife, do, except my mom. So when I saw my wife for the first time. And Sorry, Mr. Bank, allow me on. to just. When they say choose. Yes. Do you mean the culture wise, sir? Yes. Do you mean you bring a few or they actually go and say, we want you to marry from this family. Is that how the culture is? So it varies from subculture to subculture in the Indian. Give us two or three, please. Okay. So for example, in a lot of cultures, uh, girls will be presented. Let's, let's look at it from a man's 
perspective right girls a guy will go to a family's house and for example my best one of my former best friends he went to somebody's house in dar es salaam he was shown four sisters and he also choose one and he, he had never met any before no and he chose one and he chose one with the help of his mother because what they do is they ask the community and matchmakers who do you think would be the best place for my son and he met one man and he chose her and they are happily married till today uh the other choice is that the boy will come around very slowly especially in today's culture and turn around and say listen there are a couple of girls i like mom who do you think i should go with right so blessings of the parents are very very important mm-hmm. especially in our culture last but not least the culture has changed quite a bit so what you'll find is a lot of people meet online they meet at work uh they meet through friends they fall in love uh and then tell the family about it so it it works in different ways nowadays and uh, what you found is that the generation i came from which was uh with parents who are a little more open minded yet from an orthodox generation um allowed me to make those choices okay so the day i saw my wife literally even before i said hello to her I knew this is the girl I'm going to marry okay. and I don't know it was just a feeling like buying the right spectacles or wearing the right suit or knowing that the right meal has been presented to you it just felt right in my heart that this is the girl I'm going to marry right then you approached her yeah was she, was yeah she, was the, she in the same page with you uh yes in the beginning yes there was a 12 13 year difference between us in age and okay. everything else but right. you know love uh, love doesn't understand those things yes. so when I saw her I fell in love with her heart I fell in love with how she looked I fell in love how she talked just everything about her um and I knew and I was aware of the fact that there was an age difference between us so yes. um one thing that I felt was in our favor was that uh, one of uh, our religious imams turned around and said it's better to marry a younger woman uh, because they mature faster and they can adapt to your culture a little easier mm-hmm. so although she was from a different subculture um that's how we met and we we initially got married okay yeah fairy tale in the beginning fairy tale in the beginning okay yes, fairy okay. tale in the beginning and um then what happened is um my wife got pregnant and uh, when she got pregnant uh, her, her parents didn't know that we were earlier married okay so what we did is we did a ceremony basically for the parents and for society basically to show that we had got married mm-hmm. um and after that uh The next few years were very very rocky for us very very rocky because what had happened is she was 3 months pregnant and uh I had lost a lot of money um her parents called me home and said uh, you have a choice on what you want to do with the baby so they gave us choices um they gave us 5 minutes to sit down and make a decision and I looked at my wife and I said listen um I I want to stand I I want to get married and I want us to have this child and my wife choices what choices Okay we don't have to get into that but yes, anyway you made the obvious decision. choices yes, okay. obvious choices right. of either you can or cannot have I the understand. baby Okay and um my wife was very clear about it in fact she was so clear about it that she turned around to me and gave me an exit she turned around to me and said mo if you don't want to have this baby I can understand but i will have it and that just blew me away with her strength conviction at a young age not having seen the world but she was so true and connected to this baby that imagine she had just found out a couple of hours ago and she was that determined to have that baby and for me i loved her so there was no question about it on doing the right thing over here um and and plus the baby was in our culture halal so we had already been married so for me it was not an issue at all so we had our negotiations dowry and everything else etc and uh, you know we left straight into marriage mm-hmm. and 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 I've seen the son your son is a great great man you in a great great marriage now but if you allow me after the break we're going to go deeper sure please don't go anywhere because we are about to get into levels that you never thought possible well they had a decision they were given 5 minutes they didn't need the 5 minutes no. they made a decision they got married and here we are but it wasn't always a straight line so you simply cannot afford to change to another channel this is the all men show i am your friend and your coach robert brawley see you on the other side of the break
Mr. Bank is his name, a businessman, a father, and a husband. Well, and this is the Old Men Show, and I am your friend and your coach, Robert Brawley. Well, before we took a break, we were talking about how he started as a businessman, worked in the Middle East, lost his father, came back to take matters into his own hands as a leader of the family that met a beautiful lady, and they got together. Mr. Bank, mm -hmm. so you made a decision we want to have this baby, mm -hmm. we're keeping this baby, got married, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the woman you saw and said, you know what, this will be my wife. Mm -hmm. And as per the script, mm -hmm. she became your wife. She became my wife. Yes. Sure. And then the fairy tale ended. The fa exactly. Almost immediately. Almost immediately. Yeah, because there was a lot of pressure from the family. What kind of pressure, sir? So, you know... God bless my wife's family because they're fantastic people. Absolutely. Um, very cultured. and uh, But, you know, at the end of the day, they were worried because this is their only daughter. Uh, they were moving to South Africa for uh, a long period of time. Um, now they're leaving their little princess behind uh, who's having a child. Uh, this is not something they had imagined. So if you put yourself in their position, they were completely confused about this. If you put yourself in my position, I was completely confused about the whole thing. Uh, one minute I'm battling to make money, and the next minute I'm a father and a husband who's getting married with a child coming up in, three, in another six months. And then you look at my wife's position. She was young, uh, having a child, and had to acclimatize from, hang on a second, I was studying two minutes ago, and now I got to prepare for a baby all of a sudden with all these bodily changes. So... There was a lot of going on in that dynamic over there, and it brought a lot of pressure. It brought a lot of pressure. Now, for the men out there who are listening to this, you will understand this, because the financial pressure, I had always had a dream that, because I came from a very um, uh, not, not well-to-do family, that if I ever were to bring a family into this world, I wanted to do it on my terms. But God had a different plan. So my terms were that I wanted to be financially comfortable, have a decent wedding, which is something my wife also wanted, court, plan things, and then slowly, you know, gently ease into that sort of a, a, a relationship. This was a jerk for everybody, you know, and my wife and I were jerked together. We were put together very, very quickly, and that was God's plan, you know. But what it did do was there's no manual for how to prepare for something like that. So all of a sudden, yesterday, I was going up, and we got married in a week, by the way. So we knew on a Tuesday, and we were married that Friday. And I was broke, completely. If it wasn't for a really good family friend of ours who actually hosted the wedding, and even hosted and paid for the dinner, uh, I don't know what we would do. Um, but we had a quick wedding and everything else. We had a quick honeymoon. And the first thing I went into was, out of romance, I went into provider mode. And for a lot of men out there who are listening to me, you'll understand what this is about, where you want to secure your family, you want to provide for them, you're in an unstable place, you're unsure about what it is. Uh, there's a fight or flight. And over here, I wanted to fight for my family because I wanted to make sure, hang on a second, she's giving up her whole life. She's giving up her whole family. She's giving up everything to be with me. I've got to do this right. And... Um, it was difficult to do it right because I was fighting market forces. I was not experienced in business. I'd been working for a very, very long time. I just lost my savings in so many deals. So I was panicked financially. Had I been financially stable, I think I'd be a lot more stable, but I wasn't. What did the pressure make you do to your family then? Because wow, you Robert, that's a really good question. The fairy tale ended almost immediately. And the nightmare began for and my wife. Right. Which is such a shame because if I could take back time, I would really change the way I did things. So what I would do is I would come back home and uh, with a lot of pressure in the beginning. Of course. And when I came back home with a lot of pressure in the beginning, I would take it out on my wife because I was unhappy with the picture. I was unhappy with where we were staying. I was unhappy with the way what we were driving. I was unhappy with what we were eating. I was unhappy wherever we were. Uh, I was just not at peace with myself. And the pressure started coming out on my wife. And my wife, in an indirect way, without even knowing it, enabled my behavior. Because what she did is, she would comfort me. 
every time I got angry and I'd come back upset, um, you know, when you, when, when you go out as a warrior in the morning in the world and you come back empty handed, you, you feel I've wasted eight, ten hours of my day. You feel like a failure. You feel like a failure and you come back with those feelings. Now you've got a beautiful young bride at home, okay, who's about to have a child, who's done nothing wrong, you know, just waiting for her man to come home acclimatizing to this new life and a mother-in-law and a sister-in-law and so many things and there I was coming back with all this frustration she has left her whole world for me and I could see it all I could see was I'm not achieving this is not getting right I'm not doing well putting pressure upon myself and all she would do is comfort me comfort me comfort me and in that comfort I used to get more angry and more upset and then the truth of the matter is, unfortunately, and I'm only saying this on air because if there's a man out there who's doing this, then you need to stop doing this. Mm -hmm. Is it got worse? Because there was violence from my part. Physical violence? Yes, physical violence. There when was emotional abuse. There was uh, physical abuse uh, from my part. While she was pregnant? While she was pregnant, unfortunately, yes. And... Um, I think what happened is there was no balance in my life. I got so obsessed with the fact that I needed to provide. It doesn't matter what the excuse is. The fact of the matter is that ugly phase of my life should have never happened, but it did. How bad was it, more? It was bad. It was bad. It was really bad. It was so bad that after a while, my young, inexperienced wife decided after my son was born and was close to two years old, decided to leave. And um, let me ask you, yeah. and, and uh, because we'll get to the now and yes. I have the privilege of knowing you guys very closely. So I know what I'm talking about. Right. Take me into your mind at that time. Beautiful bride carrying your child. What gets into the mind at that time that you know what? I'm going to beat her and I'm putting the baby at risk. What, what clouds a man's judgment at that time? Because of course she's not s s smiling as you're beating her. She's screaming. That's a really good question. And, uh, thank you for framing it the way you did. Right. Uh, so let me get into that. that it was, I think it was the shock of getting into that situation. Right. Not knowing how to deal with it. Not having a mentor to go to, not having a way out, not having somebody to speak to, to turn around to me and say, hang on, my friend, relax. Life is not a race, it's a journey. There was this speed within me to correct situations. And the more effort I put into it, the worse it became. So it's like going to a casino and chasing money by putting good money after bad money. And all you're doing is getting deeper into the hole, if you can understand what I'm saying. And that's where I was. So the deeper I would get into the hole, the only thing I could focus on was me, my feelings, my thoughts, and how I'm failing. And then there's social pressure. So when you look at people outside, men usually do this. We compare ourselves to other men yes. and say, hang on, okay, I grew up with those people. I studied with those people. We played sports with those people. Those guys are at that place. These guys are at that place. Those guys are at that place. I should be around here. But I'm not. Yes. If you're higher, you feel a little better about yourself. If you're lower, you start to induce pressure on yourself if you, if you feel you're a winner. And that's what I did. So comparing myself. And then I felt there were no skills I had. So I did turn around and discuss things with my wife. Uh, my wife would comfort me all the time. But because she was the closest, softest, most vulnerable person around me, I lashed out at her. And let me ask you this, because there's a woman also watching. Mm -hmm. you've, told, you've talked to the men and said, there's a man watching, they need to change. Yes. But you've said, without knowing and innocently, she enabled you. Yes. Would she almost at some point blame herself for you beating her? Oh, I would take her on all kinds of guilt trips. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I took her on all kinds of guilt trips. I took her on all kinds of journeys. But I realized that 16 years later... I took her on parts where I made her feel... She deserves it. No, mm. that she wasn't enough. 
that she was uh, not right enough. And I would do this very cleverly without even realizing that I'm doing it to feel better about myself. Right. Yeah. So can you believe the person who was supporting me, I would cut them off at the legs to do this. That's ridiculous. And for the women who are out there listening to this, all I would say to you is, look, men look strong and, you know, they're all these lions and rah, they want to roar and be all these people. Sometimes they're just little boys who just don't understand what's going on. But that gives them no excuse to treat you badly. Because a woman's essence is soft, beautiful, kind, loving. And that's how it should remain. That's how it should remain. So if you are in a relationship like that, what you should do is try and get some security around you. Try and get an elder around you. Try and get a friend around you who can assist you that you can reach out to. But don't suffer it alone. What? And what I've done is cleverly is block my wife off. From talking to her friends, talking to her relatives, and so she was in. She came into this fairy tale to be happy and left her family, and what she entered into was hell. So you isolated her from any voice. Yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I isolated her completely, and unfortunately, was abusing her, and that's just the worst thing I ever did. Well, how long did you abuse her for? Uh, emotionally and physically, possibly two, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. Did she ever tell her parents? No. She never, ever told her parents. Why I'm asking this is because... And I'll tell you why she never told her parents. Right. Sorry to interrupt. It's okay. You see, she felt I've done something wrong by having a child early. And I've let down my parents. So I can't go back to them as a failure. So they weren't an option. She had a friend of hers that was a good family friend of ours, her best friend. That's the only person she could talk to. And she would talk to her secretly. And say to her, listen, this is the problem I'm going through. What should I do? What should I do? And her friend said to her, you've got to reset your marriage. You've got to leave. Mo's got to realize what he's doing. And he's not going to realize what he's doing unless you're there. And she loved me so much. So she was stuck between, I've got a child. I've got no money. I'm not educated. Uh, what do I do? You know, how do I do this? You know, and, and Mo's going through so much. So I need to be there for him, you know. And marriage is not a bed of roses. And I would come up with all these beautiful sayings about why she should stay, you know. And what I would do is, and a lot of women out there will understand this kind of behavior. I would do something really wrong to her. And then my apologies would, would win Oscar awards. Like they would. Sorry, right? I'm not supposed to be laughing. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Yeah. My wife likes to have it now. Right. Like, but my, my apologies would win Oscar awards because... I would really and genuinely and deeply feel so sorry about what I've done. So sorry. And you know what? I'd win her back. But you've got to understand something. When you do that 30, 40 times a year, it's ridiculous. Let me ask you more. Yeah. The violence comes. Mm -hmm. The Oscar award winning apology follows. <laughs> How long would you give her, as far as a break is concerned, before the next violence? Uh... I was on a short fuse. Right. You know, what I never really did, Burale, and this is the truth. When I apologized, I apologized for the surface. I told her what she needed to hear at that moment. And it would calm her down. But the inside never changed. Okay. So it would be until the next... So I was a victim. <laughs> I wouldn't call myself a victim. But I allowed myself to become a victim of my circumstances. Right. So if the wind was blowing well today, we had a good day. Okay. If the wind blew bad today... I'll take it out on her. And again, do the apology. Okay, so the the baby comes. Yes. Gibran is his name. That's right. Jibs comes. And mm. did the baby's presence make you change or did you at some point even beat her? I did. After giving birth to your son? Yeah, I did. Okay. So there was violence after. There was violence. The, the, the baby did not change things. It just gave me more pressure. All right. It gave me more... So there was joy, no doubt about it. But I still remember, after the joy, there was pressure. Like, okay, what's next? I got to provide diapers. I got to buy food. I got to buy this. And I'm just being honest about it. Right. Uh, that's how I felt. That's genuinely how I felt. I, I wasn't prepared for it. Uh, I had no savings. Um, I was scared, you know. And, you know, my beautiful wife was focused on her beautiful baby and, you know, how he's going to grow and... 
and then I'm thinking, hang on, this play group, and what is play group? And you mean you got to pay for a kid just to go and play? And you know, all these things were there. And believe it or not, Burale, you can understand something. We used to go to Park Road during the holy month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. and this is how sweet my wife was. You know those ladies who fry potatoes yes. with chili in between. Right. Yes. My wife and I used to break our fast on the road and buy those chili potatoes for a shilling 50 cents. That's how tough life was. But she stood by me in those beautiful moments and realized Mohammed has had a hard time. And if we bought five potatoes for seven shillings 50 cents, what she would do is eat two. She's feeding and give me three. That's how beautiful my wife is. And I couldn't see it. After all that, you still have an episode of slapping her? Because I didn't change on the inside. It wasn't a sincere change. Right. It, it was a superficial change. It was, it was, say what you need to do to keep the situation happy. happy. And in my mind, it was, until I make a certain amount of money and put us in a certain situation, I can't be happy. Right. So I had made rules and values for myself in life that were so difficult that I could stop to smell the roses. I couldn't stop and pause and enjoy a cup of coffee. I couldn't stop and enjoy my son getting his first tooth. So I was there, but not there, if you know what I mean. Would you advise a woman watching us tonight to talk to somebody if she's going through violence? Because one of the ways uh, is being isolated. The man who is abusing her is to make sure he, she does not talk to people. So would you advise the women to quickly talk? Because you've seen cases women have been killed. Yes. I, I would strongly advise you to do the following things, especially if you're in a marriage that's being abused. But I want you to just understand one thing on this side over here. It's very, it's very easy to focus on the abuse, but very difficult to focus on why you're being abused. And Stop it there. takes, sorry. It's very easy to focus on the abuse and miss out on why. Yes the abuse is happening. Yes. Mo, I'll ask you to just to hold on to that. Please quickly rush and get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or some cold or some juice. We're coming up after the break and we want to get deeper. Sure. Because you'll, you'll still speak to the ladies. Yes. But Shazmin asked for a divorce. Yes. After two and a half years of the baby coming forth. Yes. Well, we'll get to hear the story deeper. See you after the break. This is The Old Man Show. I'm your coach and your friend Robert Broale here with the great man, Mr. Bank. What a man, what a story. He's openly shown his scars, not for anything else, but for one or two lives to be changed. In fact, before we started recording, he said, Broale, all I want is that lives must be changed. Please, let's have this discussion as openly as we possibly can. He has not disappointed. He's saying it as it is. You see, a woman should, a woman going through domestic violence, and of course, men also go through domestic violence. But in this case, using your own story, yeah. I want you to speak to the women. Yes, a woman going through this in public, it appears all nice and beautiful. Public Indeed. success, private failure. Indeed. They're not telling the family. The family asks, how is the family? Oh, we're okay and yeah, fine yeah. and fine. And, and we did the same thing. You did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Talk to a woman. Just give them one or two tips very quickly because I want to get deeper into your story. Okay. So if you're a woman that's getting abused in a family, this is what I would say to you. It's very easy to focus on the abuse. And I know my wife who trains people says this. It, it takes at least nine attempts for a woman to want to leave until she finally does. Just reach out for help. But try not to do it maliciously and do it as early as possible. From the first signs of abuse, the first thing you need to do is communicate to the man. Secondly, get some support or leverage over him. Not in a bad way, but in a good way where he can change. Remember one thing, and I'm going to say this to you, ma'am, whoever is listening to me out there. 
You got with this man for a reason. Your instinct had God put you together for a reason. Sometimes things go wrong with men and they just don't know how to deal with it. They just don't have the tools to deal with it. And because you are trusted and you are loved, they bring that problem to you. What you've got to do is create a boundary and let them know that, listen, I love you. I'm here to support you. I'm here to positively enforce you. We can go through this together as a team. But you abusing me emotionally, physically or in any other way is unacceptable. And the minute you draw that line, he will respect you. And if he doesn't, then get somebody on the outside who will enforce that line so that he respects you and it doesn't get worse. That way you can save your marriage. What are the telltale signs? Before somebody is slapped, kicked, what are the signs? Okay, good question. So a healthy man is somebody who can balance his life. He goes out there, fights the world, and if he has problems and whatever it is, and generally that's how it is, he shares them with you and he talks about them with you and etc. But when he starts becoming really, really moody, spending time with the boys, drinking, going out over activities, and now you find balance, he's being lost. More importantly, listen to your heart. Because the minute you feel that distance is growing, that's the first sign that something is wrong in your marriage. And you've got to remedy that immediately. Remember one thing, especially to the men out there, when you get married, it's not a boys club anymore, it's a man's club. That's why it's called an institution. Okay, You have to grow up and you have to change. You are now responsible and the reason you want respect is you're the elder of a family now. But you've got to behave that way to be able to get that respect. Don't demand it, you can't buy it. And you can't beat your way through it as well. So a woman's essence is to be soft, gentle, kind and loving. Yours is to provide security and leadership by being a gentle man, not a brutal man. You need to be gentle in your strength. Your real strength, your warrior strength is for the world out there where you go and battle and everything else. But when you come back home, you learn to need, learn new skills like when you were dating, how you dated her, how you were emotionally in touch with her and everything else. You need to become an investigator. You need to get the feel of your family and your wife and you need to change some of your habits. So a lot of men, and I'll conclude this very quickly, feel that, hang on, I can have a singles lifestyle by going out to the bar and everything else. Yeah, you can if you want to. It's all in the name of blowing steam and everything else. But the truth be told is, where does your wife blow steam? It doesn't work like that. I would suggest very early in your life, become a team. And go through life together. But be the one who leads it with positive strength and secure strength. Do you know why? Because you're the man. And God made you like that. So you can lead. Okay? Sometimes you get into feminine energy where you need a little love, you need a hug, you need a kiss, you need to cry. Cry. It's fine. But make sure you do it with your family in a way where you guys come out together. And last but not least, don't forget God. As long as you have God in your life, you will come out on top. Fantastic. Amen. She asked for divorce. Yes. Justifiably so. Yes. In fact, I think she was very patient. Yes. You understand? All yeah. those years. She was. Then you get your divorce. So we got our divorce, yes. But uh, we didn't get our divorce. She asked me for a separation. Yes. And we were separated for three years. Now, in those three years, I did all the wrong things again. Again. Uh, I apologize. I did all the wrong things again. So what I did is I said, hang on a second. Who the hell does she think she is leaving me? Right. Uh, and my male ego came into play. So I did all the wrong things you could think of. I started going out with friends. Uh, I said, you know what? I'll show her. I cut her off from the money. I took advice from elders. Some cut off elders, from the money in as far as your son is concerned? Yeah, yeah. Because one elder turned around to me and said, Mo, why, 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 why are you stressing about this? Your wife doesn't have an income. Cut her off from the money. She'll be running back to you in 10 days. Ooh. I said, hang on a second. That sounds like a solution. So I did that. Another one turned around to me and said, listen, you're being too weak. Stop talking to your wife. So I did that. I tried everything under the sun to, in my heart I loved her, but I tried 
I said to myself, let me reach out to some of the elders in my community, friends and family, and see which way is the best way to handle this. Because I'm like a bowl, a fish in a bowl. I can't see the bigger picture. Right. Others who might be wiser and more experienced may see the bigger picture. But guess what, Burale? Every single answer was wrong. I created more and more distance between me and my wife. I created more and more pain for her. But guess what? My wife was virtuous. My wife was patient. And she didn't punish me. She didn't hurt me during that period of separation by ever getting me to stop seeing my son. Did you have a situation, sorry, uh, I'm going to ask this. People advising you to do these things. But did you maybe later discover some people were telling you to do this, then they would go behind your back and tell her to do something else? Yeah, yeah. All right. Even some of my own friends who were advising me on whatever it is were actually approaching my wife for uh, sex. Can you believe it? What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm, t I'm, I'm very serious. That's the real world. That's the real world. They wanted to take advantage of the situation. And when you're weak, uh, you realize the true colors of people. You know, when you're rich and when you're in a good position, everyone wants to be your friend. But when you're weak and down, er and my wife is very, very beautiful. Right. Everyone wants to take advantage of it. Yes. So I found out this a couple of years later that some of my own friends had done this. And of course, today I don't talk to them. But, you know, if those are the people who are going to stab you in the back, that's just the way the world is. Yeah. So separation three years. Yes. Did you end up with divorce? So this is the interesting thing. One day, I just said to myself, you know what? I've got to listen to my heart and what it says. And this is one year before our divorce. I turned around and I said, I've listened to this man. I've listened to this uncle. I've listened to this friend. I've listened to this cousin. What do I do here? And in my heart of hearts, it came out that, you know what? I'm not this person. I can't be this rude. I can't be this rough. I can't deny my wife this. I love my wife. So I took all those tools and I threw them away. And I said, you know what? Whatever she says to me, however much she abuses me, I'm going, to, I'm going to be steady and I'm going to keep a constant line. Right. What's in my heart? I love her. And that's the truth. The best thing I can do now is, and I had grown up a little, remember that. I'm going to love her. So every time she spoke to me, when she was angry, if she was upset, if she was in a good mood, I just showed her a consistent Muhammad now. So now I had a chat with myself internally. And that chat was that, this is your family. You love her. That's your child. What the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. Grow up, Muhammad. Get with the program. I left all my friends. I left all my sporting activities. I left everything else. And I decided to focus on healing her and getting my wife back. But here comes a twist if you want to hear it. As I was quoting my wife in that year, I went to her workplace every day for 365 days with roses in my hand. I bought her lunch every single day because I had hurt her so much. For her to heal, it was more than trust. It was consistency. It was she had to know the inside me. The person she fell in love with in the beginning was still there inside. And you can't buy that at Nakumat or at, at Naivas. You've got to be able to do it for a period of time. And you know what? Women are so clever. They can see through you faster than anything in the world. Right. And I just turned around to myself and I said this, God, I'm going to do this sincerely from my heart. I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose my child. But you know what? I've made mistakes and I'm ready to do whatever it takes to get my wife back. Now, here's the twist. After I courted her for a year and I bought an apartment in Lavington, I turned around to her and I said, why don't you move in? And guess what she said? I'll do it on one condition. You give me a divorce first. Okay. That's the twist. Right. I said, sorry, we're getting along so well. We've done everything so well for a year. She's like Mohammed. After what I've been through for the last one year, I want to make sure if anything is to go wrong in this time in the future, I am free. And there's no holes. So you can imagine... It took me about three or four weeks to understand this, that she wanted a divorce because she wanted a clean sweep. She didn't want any ties. Right. She wanted a clean slate. So the divorce happened. So the divorce happened. Because I don't want to miss out on this. and I know we are getting to the tail end of the show. The divorce happened. Mm -hmm. And, and um, 
on the day you got your divorce, you guys decided to do something crazy. We went on a date. The day you got your divorce. <laughs> okay, you guys are crazy. Fine. So there I was in our community office crying my eyes out. And she's telling me, what's the problem? We're going for a date tonight. But I was so worried. Am I going to lose my wife? You know? Am I going to lose my son? I had hoped that we're going for a date. But I was scared that it, it was coming to the end of an era. The last one, yeah. yeah. Now, I have had the privilege of sitting with you guys in your house. Sure. And you are actually, and, and, and the viewers, I'm telling you this. This is not for TV, really. You are an amazingly beautiful family. Alhamdulillah. Proper love and respect. I've seen how you love your wife. Thank you. How did you win the trust? Because now, <laughs> I don't want people to get it wrong, thinking, oh, okay, every woman who has been battered by the husband, it's okay, get back together. How did you get to this place? Because I work with your wife on my radio, on our radio show. That's right. And during the break, she's calling you, you're calling her. Yeah. Hi, Mo, hi, sweetie. Yeah. You know, come pick me. Me, I'm thinking about my dog waiting for me at home. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have seen the genuine love. Yeah. How did you win the trust? And very, very quickly, because guys are watching okay. and you're about to go to the end of the show. How then you have battered this woman for years, got in your divorce, brought her back to your space. How did you win her trust? Okay. For the guys out there um, who are going through a difficult marriage, a rocky marriage, or even a marriage that started with a lot of love and it's died out, you can revive anything. First, you've got to change yourself. Okay. Secondly, how do you change yourself? Work backwards. Ask yourself, listen, because I'll tell you one thing. When you're sick, when you're old, when you're dead, your family is going to stand behind you. Or your friends, not your relatives, nobody else, just your family. And if you want a beautiful family, then it's like a farm. If you don't invest in it, you're not going to get any return out of it. If you want to hang out with the boys and expect your wife to be there, that's not going to happen. So what I did is I turned around and I said, what does she need? She needed love, she needed security, she needed reassurance. And you know what I said to myself? I am going to lower my ego completely. I have no right now to feel like, hey, I'm the dawn of the house. That mm. is over. Mm. Excuse me, I don't know if I can it's use fine. that language. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to assure my wife that everything is fine. And I changed my behavior completely. I was subservient. I made her feel comfortable. I made her feel loved. But in her value system, not in my value system. What does that mean? I did show her love the way I thought it was important. So, for example, in the beginning, I made mistakes. I would buy her perfumes. I'd buy her diaries. I would buy her this. Her. That's not her. She didn't want that. What did my wife want? My wife wanted one romantic rose if it made a difference. To come home and spend quality time with her for five or ten minutes before I went on to the phone. To have a picnic in the garden just with two cups of coffee and speak. To get in touch and connect with her emotionally and understand what she's going through. To see her concerns, her wishes and everything else. So what I did is I put my business life aside, everything else aside and everything and listened to her heart, her mind and her soul with full, sincere, dedicated attention. And I could see the return would come back. Because when I put myself back and I put her forward, we started to heal her. And she started to see value in this relationship. And she started to see, hang on, the man I married is here. The guy I fell in love with is genuinely here. And he shows up for me every single time consistency is the key well, and, and to be honest you are a model of a man uh, uh, and a family for that matter and Thank may you. god just kind. continue blessing you and and your I mean, son you have a 17 year old 16 yeah, 16 turning 17. turning 17 may god just continue blessing you Allah, and and uh, you have an amazingly beautiful and kind wife indeed and and um, you was worked all right. You have told men, the women, that sometimes men, we appear strong, the lion. And, but deep down, we, we are small boys. You understand? Yeah. Do you help many couples now? Yes. With your wife? Yes. To try and reconcile them? Yes. You do? 
Yes. Uh, on a private basis, yes. we help very many people. Right. My wife helps more people than I do. Uh, I help a lot of men uh, within my community who show up privately to speak to me, uh, within the Indian community, um, all sorts of cross-section of people who realize that we've been through this. Right. Uh, and they come up, and there are a lot of men out there, unfortunately, who are really lost. And they really want better marriages and really want to be better people. So it's amazing. It's just that people are lost. That's it. Would you be willing to come and be one of the speakers in the, my men's conference? I would love to, Burale. Okay. It right. would be an honor and a pleasure, honestly. Okay. All right. Because I feel just like you take your car to be aligned and camber done and balancing done, we all need that in life a little. Right. So whoever we can help, because I was helped, uh, I can help. Hey, that's just paying it forward. Right. I don't know what you're going through as a couple. Uh, through Mr. Mo's story, uh, we have to be very careful also about friends when you're going through hell and high water. Yes. Because some of those are the ones who stabbed you at the back. True. All right? True. Uh, find yourself as a man. Yes. I'm looking for the last, uh, I want to summarize what he said. Find yourself, love your wife based on her values. That's right. Right? Right. And, and it's not all lost. It's not all lost. It's not all lost. So he here's the thing, guys. You may think, hang on, I bought my wife a chauffeur pen or a Mont Blanc sunglass and she's not appreciative. Let me tell you one thing, guys. M women don't necessarily marry us for our money. Some do, some don't. But deep down inside, what a woman really wants is you. She wants your heart. She wants to be protected. She wants to feel loved. She wants to see your kindness. She wants your attention. She wants you to be a good dad. And for you to be able to do that, the only way you can do that. You know, they say there's a very beautiful saying in this heart that God says you either have space for the world in this heart or for him in this heart. It's the same with marriage. You either have a single life or you have a married life. And if you are the sort of person who is in limbo and listening to this, choose the married life. Because I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind away. And that is this, if you develop the right skills and treat your wife the right way, there is a sweetness at the end of that rainbow that you will experience daily that you will get addicted to. And the next generation will grow up so healthy and happy that you will, you'll be really proud of yourself, but wow. you have to invest in it. Thank you very much. I mean, this is a man who they would buy five uh, potatoes, the roast, yeah. the roast <laughs> yeah. and now one of the most successful businessmen you can ever think of. It is the love, the honor, and the value system. <music> Mr. Mohammed, the one thing you would do when alone? Ah, I love watching movies, relaxing, but the thing I do the most is a daily stock take. So whenever I have time alone, what I do is, I look at my family, my son, my wife, my business, my spirituality, and see where I am and what needs work. And then I input that time into that to make sure the levels are always high. But remember one thing, if your family life is perfect, the rest of your life will fall into place. Which is your favorite song? My favorite song is Hey Jude by the Beatles. What makes you laugh the most? My wife and my son, they crack the funniest jokes. Which is the most memorable event you've ever attended? Um, getting an award by, uh, by Marriott in Dubai, uh, where I was presented an award in front of uh, a lot of people and I got a chance to give a speech as well. One word to describe Kenyans? The most heartwarming, resilient people who get taken for a ride all the time. One place you'd never, you'd never wish to visit? Pakistan. Who is the most friendly person you know? My wife and my son. Pilau or Ugali? Pilau. Which is your favorite sport? Uh, golf. Who is your role model? Anthony Robbins. Thank you very much. Well, I have been your friend and your coach, Robert Burale. This, of course, is the best show in Eastern Central Africa, south of the Sahara, north of Limpopo, only on Switch TV. And the show, the old men show. And I've been here with a great friend, great man, Mr. Bank. Thank you very much. See you next week.